So, Patrick, this is a very informal meeting, uh, in a sense. The photo IP is a situation where we usually discuss issues related to public policy and political theory. And the idea, as Pablo said, is to discuss particularly the last chapter of your book, when you talk about the relationship between your analysis and what might be a post-liberal social order. Um, I want to begin by asking you what are the prospects of liberalism? You begin the final chapter of the book uh, with very interesting uh, remarks. Let me quote a bit from, from the book. The narrowing of our political horizons has rendered us incapable of considering what we face today is not a set of discrete problems solvable by liberal tools, but a systemic challenge arising from, from pervasive in, invisible ideology. The noble lie of liberalism is shattering because it continues to be believed and defended by those who benefit from it, while it is increasingly seen as a lie and not an especially noble one by the new servant class that, that liberalism has produced. This divide between the elite and the servant class, echoing in some sense the prospects of Hilaire Belloc, I, or at least I, I, I read it as that, mm -hmm. this divide would only widen. The crisis will become more pronounced. The political duct tape and economic spray paint will increasingly fail to keep the house standing. The end of liberalism is in sight. I wonder if you can just elaborate a bit on that, uh, maybe as a way of introducing us to the central thesis of the book. Okay. Uh, for, so, for um, so first, thank you, uh, Idea Pais, uh, for this invitation, uh, for working me so hard during my visit, and uh, uh, for this opportunity to speak with you, um, and. Uh, 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 particularly now, uh, as I'm beginning now to see the beginning of the end of my visit, uh, now to spend a little time talking about the end of my book, uh, which begins to try to feel its way toward thinking about what's next. And I, and I admit it's tentative. Uh, it's a tentative chapter because, um, for me, the most important part of writing the book was to get out the analysis of what I think our crisis was. Uh, I actually used the image of the noble lie, which I don't, is there a good translation in Spanish? Uh, sí, una mentira noble o blanca. And, and this is familiar to you from Plato's Republic. Yeah. Okay. So those of you familiar with Plato's Republic, uh, in the uh, in uh, the beginning toward the beginning of the Republic, the philosopher Socrates proposes that for the good society to come into being, it requires a noble lie. And that this noble lie has two parts. The first part of the noble lie is that we are all born of a common mother. So that we all have, we're all brothers and sisters in our, in our, in our city. And the second part of the noble lie, he says, is that when we're born, we each have a different metal in our soul. And some people are born with gold souls, and some people are born with silver souls, and some with bronze, and some with uh, base metal iron. Uh, the noble lie, then, is an attempt to address two phenomena that we're very familiar with. As a society, what binds us together? Is there anything that binds us together? And as a society, how do we understand what our differences, and in particular, our differences as they are manifest in a difference of talents, in differences of ability, uh, in different intelligence, beauty, strength, athletic ability, and so forth. Socrates then says that everyone in the society needs to believe this lie for it to work, because what it will do is explain that even though we have these inequalities, these inequalities are in the service of a common family. And he says, for this, for this lie to work, everyone must believe it. But he says, the philosophers, those who will have the gold souls, will be less likely to want to believe it. And this has always intrigued me, this observation. Why would the philosophers be less likely to want to believe this? 
whereas the common people would be more inclined to believe it. And I think the common interpretation is that, well, the philosophers are philosophers and they'll see through this lie. They'll see that it's false. Whereas the regular, ordinary people are more easily deceived. But I think there's a deeper reason that, that takes place here, which is that um, the philosophers, and Socrates says this later on, the philosophers won't necessarily want to believe that we're all born of common parents. Or let's say the elite won't necessarily want to believe that we're all born of common parents. There's a scene later in the Republic where Socrates, this is a famous scene as well, it's the, the image of the cave. And Socrates says uh, uh, the philosophers won't want to come back down to the city. They'll want to stay above the cave. They want to be philosophers. Uh, and then Socrates says, well, we'll have to compel them to go back down, to be a part of the family. They will have to be forced to go back down. The common people, it seems to me, are willing to believe that there are natural differences between human beings if they believe that the people with gold in their souls believe that we're a common family. In other words, there's a kind of contract. We accept that there is inequality in the world if that inequality is in the service of ourselves as a common family. And I think, in many ways, what we have today is a situation where our elite in our society today think that they have accepted the noble lie, but in fact do not. They, um, they believe that they have accepted the idea that their talents are put to the common good, but in fact they deny it, as Socrates predicted that they would. So this is the reason why I suggest that this, uh, this noble lie in some ways, which I think, <laughs> to push this further, I think when Socrates suggests this is a noble lie, I actually think it's, he's, he subtly is suggesting it's true. Hmm. This is the truth about our condition. Uh, that the condition that we're in today is that those who are especially advantaged by the differences of talent and ability in our liberal society have led themselves to believe that they believe we're all in this together, but they have built a society in which they are increasingly living apart. And uh, although I've finished this uh, section of the book before Donald Trump and before Brexit, I think uh, it's... Um, in many ways was anticipating um, what, we, what we are seeing today. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it's interesting how, just picking on a particular dimension of that problem, when you discuss earlier in the book the work of the economist Tyler Cowen, mm. um, he gives a response to the challenges that inequality poses to our societies, which is uh, fairly common in liberal circles. Mm. And the short and perhaps simplified version of that response would be, yes, inequalities are growing within countries and worldwide, but what's the problem? Just let's give people money. So policies like uh, universal basic income um, are being discussed, and there seems to be some sort of agreement between left and right on several countries, mm -hmm. on the desirability of these, these sort of policies. Um, why do you think the, the liberal response, going back to the main, main thesis of the book, is predictably, let's give people more money because they will, in that way, fulfill their desires mm -hmm. and perhaps become unaware, or maybe they would see the inequalities are somehow justified. Mm -hmm. And you know, even when uh, there's another strand of, let's say, liberal thinking, which is not maybe as eager to give money away, mm -hmm. um, but which will make the argument that uh, those who think that they are not well off are much better off in a liberal society than they are in a pre-liberal society. You know, that, that which we consider poverty today would be wealth beyond what any king in an earlier age could have imagined. So I think you might have a debate whether let's give people money or, or they should be happy. But, the, but the, the basic agreement in this is that if you have sufficient material 
um, uh, resources, you should be content. Yeah. Um, Is the rising tide analogy? The rising, yeah, the rising tide raises all boats. And uh, of course, I, I am I'm not here to say to deny that human beings require certain physical goods to uh, as a part of flourishing. But I say that carefully as a part of flourishing. That you could say, uh, you know, with Maslow's hierarchy of of goods and so forth, that there's a baseline requirement for human goods to flourish. But beyond that, there are other goods that are not as easily measurable in material terms that human beings require to flourish and to be happy. Uh, and this is where I'm often confronted by critics who will cite data from Steven Pinker, uh, Deirdre McCloskey, yeah. which is irrefutable that we are in a better material circumstance today than 20, 40, 50 years ago. And I, I was presented with this argument just yesterday by one of your liberal thinkers uh, <laughs> at ICADA. Uh, and I, again, I think this is indisputable. But I guess to that response, uh, it's, um, it's simply the case that we can also see through measurable data that even in a condition of material satisfaction, if human beings are in what we could say certain kinds of emotional, relational, and even spiritual poverty, that those material forms do not satisfy. They cannot satisfy the deepest longings and requirements of the human soul. And so I would, I would bring to the table then a number of other statistics, if this has to be a battle of empirical uh, evidence, uh, that in today, at least in the United States, what we are seeing strikingly, at the same time we have a rising tide of material prosperity, we see also a rising tide of measurable unhappiness. Uh, and especially unhappiness associated with a stated experience of loneliness. Uh, there have been now several studies, one that just came out only in recent days, uh, describing and exploring the deep sense of isolation being experienced by a growing number of Americans uh, in our society. And the less well off you are, the more likely it is you are to be in this condition. Uh, the, uh, the striking for the first time, in, I think maybe in American history, at least since, since this has been measured, a decline in the age of average mortality in the United States. So since they've begun measuring this, the mortality, age of mortality, age of death has risen. So you're from 50s into the into 60s years, and now in 70s and even 80 into your 80s. And for the first time, this decreased in the last several years because of suicide rates of people taking their lives. Uh, so again, this is a uh, a striking statistic, uh, it, it, as well as the uh, rise of uh, the the mortality arising from opioid addiction, so the sort of self-medication of pain of various types. So I, 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 uh, what I find in particular striking about Tyler Cowen, who is a libertarian economist and who wrote a book um, called Average is Over, and this is, I quote from some passages in that book, he describes a world in which we will have a, inevitably, he says, a divide between what he describes as 85 or 90 percent of the population that will be chronically not employed, not useful, no longer contributing anything significant or of use to human society, but will be satisfied and happy because they will be in a position to consume. And he mentions in particular consume free internet, pornography and YouTube which sometimes are the same thing, uh, <laughs> that this will become a, a, a sufficient condition of their satisfaction. And he says 10 to 15 percent of the population which will enjoy lives of incredible satisfaction of their work and being productive and engaged in an economy and as uh, people who contribute something to the economy. And he then concludes this passage by saying, 
it Marx once believed that he was bringing into the world a utopia, but as we see, it is capitalism that is bringing into the world a utopia. He regards this situation, coming situation, as utopian. I dare say, uh, and I wonder what he has to say about this now, but if, if this populist reaction is any indication of how the 85 to 90 percent feel about this situation, it may not be quite utopia. <laughs> That's interesting because it's connected to another strand of uh, liberal thinking, and particularly the libertarian uh, philosophical arguments uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world. Um, and one example that comes to mind is the work of Jason Brennan. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, Brennan wrote a famous book, uh, which has been translated by a liberal think tank here in Chile, called uh, Why Not Capitalism? Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's a response to the work of Jerry Cohen, the British uh, analytic philosopher, Why Not Socialism? And it's again a, 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 ut a capitalist utopia. Mm -hmm. But the same Brennan uh, recently published, not that recently, but I think a year ago, maybe two years mm -hmm. ago, uh, a book called Against Democracy. Uh, and he calls for an epistocracy, and you, 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 you engage with his work uh, mm -hmm. throughout the book at, at some point. Uh, and the main argument is people are ignorant, not well informed, to participate in political debate. So we should have a technical ruling class. Um, I think at some point in the book he mentions that uh, um, free market economics is a, is a fundamental uh, civic, um, it's part of fundament, fundamental civic education. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the epistocracy is supposed to replace the ignorant, the not well informed, the the citizen in general. Mm -hmm. So if if anything, that there's there's a huge disconnection between this way of seeing the world and what is actually happening and how people are reacting to that. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on, on, on the work of Brennan and how it relates to the, the emergence of populisms of various sorts? Mm -hmm. So, um, among other things, uh, Brennan, of course, argues on behalf of, uh, as you put it, the epistocracy, um, a managerial, technocratic ruling class. So, in some ways, it's a kind of return to a platonic ideal of the philosopher king who will, with greater knowledge, rule over uh, an otherwise um, not well-informed and even ignorant population. But, it, again, he makes this argument in some ways, like Tyler Cowen, that this is a condition that should be highly satisfying uh, to those who will be ruled because they will be relieved of any uh, burden of having to think about politics, which he seems to suggest why would anyone want to think about politics when you can he even begins this book by saying people would far rather spend their time watching television, um, uh, planting a garden, um, taking a bike ride, shopping, rather than having to think about politics. And you know, we might say, well, that might be the case. Uh, maybe it is the case that people would like to spend a lot less time thinking or worrying about politics. So here, here we're actually engaged in some ways about a question of, of human nature, it seems to me. And I think at the, from the very birth of liberal philosophy and the liberal anthropology, the assumption was the following. Man is by nature an apolitical animal. Man is by nature not political. So it's a direct contradiction of the argument or claim made first by Aristotle that man is by nature a political animal. And of course, the claim made by Thomas Aquinas augmenting Aristotle, man is by nature a political and social animal. So there's a, it's more than merely a claim about whom should rule uh, on what basis someone should rule. It's a deep claim about human anthropology, about our nature. And the claim is that human beings do not want to be engaged in the project of building and participating in the common life, in the life of the citizen. The, the word citizen, Latin root, means to be a member, a, a, a member of a city, or in its Greek, variation to be a polites, to be a member of the Greek polis. 
I, th uh, I think, again, we have on our hands an empirical claim. Hmm. Uh, and uh, perhaps this is a, an empirical claim that's difficult to settle. I think it is the case, it is patently and clearly the case, that liberal political orders have always been shaped in the effort to limit citizenship, to limit, in particular, citizenship as an active form of participation. From its very origins, liberal political philosophy and liberal political structures aimed to limit this idea of our political nature. And we can say this was part of the structures of early liberalism, um, the American constitutional order, arranging representation in a certain way to limit, it was hoped, the too active participation of citizens. The arguments of John Stuart Mill in his book on representative uh, democracy, arguing that those with greater knowledge, more degrees, should receive more votes. So very much anticipation of Brennan's argument. And I think, so Brennan is really an inheritor of this, of this tradition. It seems to me that um, part of the story of our, our experience with liberalism over the last 250, 400 years, what you will, is one of an ongoing form of a limitation of our being as a political animal combined with episodic efforts to protest or rebel against that condition. And this is often called populist. We are not going through the first populist moment in the history of liberalism. It's only just one of a long history of populist efforts. And it seems to me that there is kind of, there's something of a, uh, a, a debate taking place in the real world of politics over this question of whether our nature is to be political animals. I, I, I'll end with one final thought, although I, I could talk about this for, this is in some ways the subject of my next book. So um, one of the claims that's often made by figures like a Brennan or many of his, uh, it seems to be especially libertarians that like to talk about the, um, the intelligence deficit or the knowledge deficit of citizens is I think there's a kind of swindle or a kind of sleight of hand going on in these claims. Because in, in some ways, you, this is what's happening. You set up a political system that's designed to limit political participation on a very immediate scale of people by and through which in the, let's say, Republican tradition, would be understood how it is you come to have civic capacity. In other words, we're, we're not born with civic capacity. Oh, oh, I shouldn't say, we're born with the civic capacity, but that capacity has to be exercised to become realized. Right? We're not born good citizens. We have to be made to be good citizens. So you create structures that limit people's ability to act as citizens and then you say, look, these people are not good citizens. We have to limit the citizenship or participation of these people who are not good citizenship. It's as if saying, uh, um, you know, these people aren't very strong. They don't, uh, they don't have good muscle form. So we should keep them away from the exercise machines that they might injure themselves with. When what they really need is to work their muscles. So I think there's a kind of, there's a very manipulative way in which the, this conclusion is reached about the lack of civic, uh, uh, the, or the, um, the absence of the fulfillment of civic capacity. That tension is very interesting. It's also present in Hume and Kant when, well in Hume famously, when he said that political institutions should be designed as though people were knaves. Mm -hmm. So you design institutions as though people were knaves. Right. Obviously, didn't, Hume didn't think everybody was a naive, but just in case that you'd be designed so. But then the consequence of that might be that those very same institutions are, are actually turning people into naives. Right. Yeah. Um, 
there's very interesting research yeah. going on in behavioral economics now on the relationship between institutions and, and how what shapes. economists call preferences. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it's a more general claim, I, I think, be, between institutions and, and moral character. Right? Yeah. yeah, and, and how, that, how these, right, how the assumptions that go into building these institutions realize the assumptions. Exactly. Right? Uh, I mean, this is this is now some an interesting finding of. Um, uh, an interesting finding of the way in which the study of economics affects the human character. <laughs> That's one of the most interesting findings, I think, of all of social science. They've done studies of students, uh, and they measure their empathy and inclination to be um, charitable, self-giving, self-sacrificing. And they measure them in a kind of control group, and then before and after they've taken one or two economics courses. And in those economic courses, they are taught that they are actually self-maximizing individuals. And this is the understanding of what human nature is that they're presented as, an, as a given, as a simple fact of their nature. And it turns out that the students who have taken economics courses, after those courses, they are actually more selfish. Not because they were born that way, but because they were made that way. So I think it's important to understand the ways in which, um, and, and maybe one of the deeper, or, or the arg part of my arguments that I really try to dig deeply about the liberal order, is the liberal order is premised upon an assumption of what our nature is. And it does not recognize, or perhaps even you could say it shields or shrouds how, in, as any political order will do, it shapes us into the kind of person that it assumes that we are. It makes us into that kind of a human being. Um, just in this regard, relating this back to um, citizenship, the other night uh, I was in a conversation about the American Federalist Papers. Uh, and uh, so the, the deep assumptions that went into the American Constitution and one, I've, one of the passages that I always find to be, in some ways, the most telling about the deepest assumptions of the American constitutional order is a passage that occurs when James Madison is discussing whether or not the Congress, the House of Representatives in particular, should be large or small. There was a big debate over this question. And the debate was, should we have a large House of Representatives so that you have relatively um, uh, a, a, a relatively small number of people being represented by their representative so that there's a closeness between the people and the Congress and the person who's representing them? Or should you have a large number of people who are being represented by one person so that it's more distant, the relationship is more distant? And James Madison argues that you want to have a small House of Representatives so that they will represent a large population because you don't want a lot of people to get together. And you don't want a lot of people to, to get together because it's not even that we're necessarily knaves. It's that we are most likely to be knaves when we're with other people. And the more people that we're with, the worse we will be. And this is the passage that you find in Federalist 55 on, in this discussion. He says, in all numerous assemblies, the passions always, uh, the, the scepter of reason is always seized by the passions. Uh, and and uh, were, even were every member of the Athenian assembly a Socrates, the Athenian assembly would still have been a mob. It wouldn't matter if every member of the assembly were as rational and reasonable and philosophic as Socrates. Putting all those rational, reasonable philosophers together would make them into a mob. And I think that's, that's very revealing of the psychology and yeah. assumption about human nature that I think animates the liberal society. So when Brennan argues, better that everyone just tend their garden, do their, you know, be on the computer, watch YouTube, it's really an argument that we should design a society in which we are as alone and solitary as possible. That's very interesting. Before going to some, some reflections on, the, on what a post-liberal social order would, would look like, there's one potential critic that a liberal might make to, 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 
to the main thesis of the book. And let me try to interpret the, the, the counter argument correctly and then see if you agree with my, my, my potential response. So some might say, well, liberalism is a, is a very, uh, is a broad church, right? So there are various traditions and liberals of various sorts. And it's hard to simplify things uh, as you do. So one potential answer, I think, is that you can say, well, this is a this is a framework that allows me to explain the history of our of Western societies in the last 200 or 400 years, whatever you put the beginning of liberalism. Another potential response, which I think is more interesting, is to say that you would agree that you are simplifying things about the history of liberal thought, but your account of liberalism is not an account of the nuances of the liberal tradition, but an account of the way in which citizens perceive themselves now in liberal orders, and how that reflects upon some of the anthropological assumptions of the mm -hmm. origins of liberalism. Uh, the, that, uh, I, need to, I need to write that answer down, because that, <laughs> that should be my answer. Uh, it's, it's a very good one. Um, but um, I, actually, I think um, I actually want to make a stronger claim uh, and maybe more vulnerable for that reason, that I actually want to say there is, um, I agree, there's lots of variations within the liberal tradition and ways of understanding different liberals. So we're talking about a big church, lots of different thinkers who disagree with each other, sometimes very ferociously. Um, but yet I want to say that there's something, you know, if, the, if we call this thing under the same label of liberalism, then what is it that holds it together? What is it that, in spite of a broad church, it's a church, right? There's something, there's, there's, it's, in, it's people in one building. And what is the nature of that building that makes it one? Uh, and here, here I want to say that um, maybe it's more of an argument about a dynamic that um, takes some time to see. So maybe it's a little Hegelian. But, uh, uh, that um, from the basic premise that we began with, uh, that human beings are by, their, by nature apolitical animals. We are born in a condition of freedom, the state of nature. That condition of freedom, or how we define freedom, is the absence of e external constraints. And the only constraints that are legitimate are those that we take on by our own consent. And of course, this is originally a theory of government, a theory of liberal government, John Locke and the American Constitution, that we take on, um, we agree to certain kinds of authority, political authority, because we have consented to that authority, uh, and that the only legitimate form of a restraint upon or a limitation on our natural liberty is that to which we ourselves have consented to. And the only legitimate way in which that consent can be understood to be legitimate is that it's a consent of our limitation of, let's say, an apparent limitation of our liberty toward the end of actually securing our liberty or even advancing our liberty. Right? We agree to a government not because I want to be restrained, but because this government will actually make it more possible for me to enjoy the security of my natural liberties, of my rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This basic core kernel, I think, is really the essence of what, when I say liberalism. But it cannot be contained merely to the political realm. And this is where I think we might have some debates with, I would have some debates with classical liberals. A classical liberal will say, yes, this is true about political forms. But it doesn't extend to the social realm. It doesn't extend to limitations that we might have as a result of being born into families and born into communities and born into a religious tradition. Right? That this idea of this autonomous free individual might be true to think as we think about politics, but it bears no implications for social, the sort of social and personal realm. Here I think that kernel of an idea articulated by John Locke in this case has to give birth to the, let's say, the, the, its extension by someone like John Stuart Mill. Hmm. It has to. 
Hmm. What John Stuart Mill understands is that our liberty to enjoy right, our freedom or the enjoyment of our liberty, even if secured politically, let's say you have the right structures of government, can't be thought to be genuinely enjoyed if we are governed by society. If the true enjoyment of my liberty is theoretically free because I have political rights, but is constrained because society might disapprove of what I want to do. It might either have informal kinds of rules in the form of custom or even legal limitations on what it is I want to do. But especially custom, right? And John Stuart Mill in his great book on liberty argues that the real despotism of his time, even though there are liberal political institutions, the real despotism, he says, is custom. That's the real despotism. And so a liberal society goes from one in which you could say we have to have these political rights to one in which we begin to say the political order needs to weaken the role of custom, mm. the role of tradition, the role of institutions that may limit my liberty that aren't political, even to the point where you may need government now to be a force of <laughs> liberation for the individual to begin to roll back the rule of custom and so forth. So it seems to me that um, whether, we, whether we have a minimalist understanding of liberalism in that Lockean understanding or a more maximalist understanding in John Stuart Mill, it's of the same church. And in this sense, uh, you know, here I would have a debate and a disagreement with many classical liberals, and I have. Um, here, I think, uh, in many ways, the evidence is on my side. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's talk about um, after liberalism for a while. Okay. Um, you argue, page 100, 182, imagining a, a humane alternative to either liberalocratic despotism or the rigid and potentially cruel authoritarian regime that may replace it seems at best a parlor game, at worst a fool's errand. Yet engaging in the activity, once central to political philosophy, the negotiation between the utopian and realistic, begun by Plato in the, Repu in the Republic, remains essential if the grimmer scenarios of a life after liberalism are to be avoided and something potentially better brought into being. So I wanted to start this brief reflection in the time we have with a lot less time to the talk about the future of liberalism because you uh, in the book say that this is just tentative, right? So, uh, but in that regard, I wanted to uh, begin with a, uh, a quote from the politics of Aristotle when he says that with regard to the regime, it belongs to the same science to study what the best regime is which regime is fitting for which cities, for it is perhaps impossible for many to obtain the best. So neither the one that is superior simply, nor the one that is the best that same circumstances allow should be overlooked by the good legislator and the political ruler in the true sense. And thirdly, any given regime should be studied with a view to determining both how it might arise initially and in what matter it might be preserved from the longest time once in existence. So what is interesting about Aristotle's understanding of political science is that what we today call political theory and then what the, the economists and political scientists call institutional design are part of the same discipline. Mm -hmm. And there should be some dialogue between them. Mm -hmm. So how to engage in this? You say that you make three caveats. First, the achievements of liberalism must be acknowledged in the sense that the way in which the liberal tradition drew upon pre-liberal conceptions of liberty, dignity, responsibility should be taken in. Secondly, you say we must outgrow the age of ideology. And thirdly, from different ways of political and economic practices, a better theory of politics and society might ultimately emerge. My first question is, how do you see the role of theory and practice in this uh, imagining 
is the exercise of imagining a post-liberal social order. In one sense, you have um, a very fragmented uh, intellectual culture where political scientists, economists, and philosophers rarely talk to each other. But yet, imagining in alternative institutions would require empirical work, theoretical work, mm -hmm. policy analysis, and so on. So how do you see the intellectual aspect of the project, even though you say that it's not better th theories we need, but better practices, but certainly you, you recognize that there is a yeah. dependency on theory, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, in fact, the, that, that last argument, we need better practice than better theory, it, it's not, um, uh, that's kind of a suggestion of, it's a little bit of a order of, um, uh, the order in which I think is we're likely to undertake, sort of to answer the question, what does one do now, hmm. sort of at the end of the book. And that, and so that, that sentence and that, that sentiment is that, um, the project you just described, we are going to need a lot of reflection, thinking, testing, empirical, theoretical work. Uh, that is going to take a while, and so what do we do now? And that's where I suggest um, here we can actually begin to engage in certain practices. Uh, and um, I think of those practices, and I describe in some spots those practices as the building, I, I actually describe it as building an anti-anti culture, if I can put it that way. Uh, as part of the book, I argue that liberalism creates an anti-culture. And this relates to what I was just saying about John Stuart Mill, that, it, that to become the fully free autonomous individual, we have to be freed from the limitations of culture. That culture is, uh, it's a vessel that shapes us. Right? It, it gives us certain kinds of worldviews, and it limits the kind of person I can be. And it seems to me one of the one of the primary objects of, you know, advancing in modern liberalism is to teach us that we're all multicultural. This is an object and lesson. And think about what that means. It is to teach us that we belong in no particular culture. We transcend all cultures. We can appreciate all cultures, but we're not members of any particular culture. And let's think about what that means. That means we live in an anti-culture. We live in a kind of non or negative culture. Uh, and so in a way you could say the world that's created is one in which we're supposed to appreciate all cultures in which there is no actual culture. So it means you could go to a lot of different kinds of restaurants is really the, the upshot uh, of that. And everyone can celebrate St. Patrick's Day and Mardi Gras and lots of cultural traditions that have no meaning anymore right? uh, in, a, in its original cultural context. So uh, I suggest the first thing that, that, that one can do right away is to begin to build um, an anti-anti-culture and that one can do this in one's own home. In fact, that's where this is most likely going to happen is to build such a thing in one's own home. And this means, in some ways, avoiding exactly what Tyler Cowen describes. Uh, you have to avoid being merely a consumer of the anti-culture. You actually have to begin thinking about how do I be a producer of culture and this means thinking of the home not as a place of consumption, which if you think about it, that's what the home is today. The home is a place where you take everything in. Like I'm always amazed to see everybody walking in home, walking to their home with all their grocery bags. And it's a place where almost nothing is made anymore. Nothing is produced within the, within the home and the household, even to the point today where we don't even produce children in homes and households. So they become non-productive, consumptive homes. And, in English, maybe in Spanish, the word consumption was once used to describe a disease. Uh, too much consumption will kill you. So what is it to, to, to make a productive household? And here I think this is to build this anti-anti-culture, to build a culture uh, beginning with one's home. And if you are so fortunate, and maybe you have to be very thoughtful about this, to recognize that a home can't be a culture, you have to be part of a broader ecology of homes and maybe neighbors, and maybe a neighborhood. And one of the things that I'm really quite hopeful about in the American context is that there is a growing number of intentional communities of people often, often of religious traditions, um, not always, who are attempting to do just this, to find places in either cities or near cities or outside of cities or in rural settings, and to build communities where 
the kind of culture that I'm talking about can be a shared project of many households, as it, as it has to be. Not merely one home, but a multiplicity of homes. And to begin to build this culture. And this is when I say that we need better practices. In some ways, what I'm suggesting is that we can have all the theories that we want. But unless you populate the world with this alternative, it seems to me, you know, we can build the theory, but there will be nobody there to inhabit it. But that said, I think, it's, I think the role of policy and, of course, economics and law all play an extraordinarily important role here. And here I will, um, you know, I will agree profoundly with many libertarian critiques of the way in which the modern state is destructive of these kinds of forms of culture, how it absorbs so much of civil society in and through its activities. But I don't conclude, like my many classical liberal friends, that the appropriate response is simply to say that government is always and everywhere bad, that we simply need as little of it as possible. And here I think we need to think especially in the context of the modern economy, what, in what, what, what role can the state play in particular in fostering economic forms that make it far more likely that many of us will be participants in a productive economy? that many more people will have some significant forms uh, or opportunities to participate in good work. Now, I, I, I'm not an economist, and I'm sure I'll be accused of being a, just simply a romantic dreamer and an idler. But I, I'll give you one example that I just I find so, um, I find personally so affecting, because it's very personal. Uh, when I first, visited, the first time I visited my now father-in-law. Uh, my wife is German, and the first time I went to Germany, I visited my father-in-law, and he is the metzger, the butcher. Uh, not a mass murderer, but uh, the, <laughs> he makes sausage uh, in, uh, in his small town in Germany. And I was asking him about his business and asking him about his, you know, what he does. And he told me something on that first day I met him, which has really stayed with me. He told me, he said, in Germany, men like him or businessmen like him were able to stay open and keep their home a productive home because it was a family business. His family worked in the business. He was able to keep his home, his, his business open because of the German closing laws. In Germany, you're required to close your business at 6.30 p.m. And he said if he didn't, if he was not able, if, if this was not a rule that applied equally to small businesses as well as to large businesses, he would be driven out of business by the larger businesses that could hire cheap labor, minimum wage employees, for whom then this would be a convenience to consumers who could shop at any time of day but would drive him out of business because he would want to close at 6.30 so he could be home with his family. So here is, a, here is a state intervention in the market, which we are told by Milton Friedman is a gross injustice. But at least as my father-in-law explained it, and I heard this again and again from small business owners, this was the difference between staying in business as a small family-owned business and creating a society that gives advantages to big chain stores that hire cheap labor, who have no investment in those places, who couldn't care less if they're working for this chain store or that chain store. Mm -hmm. This is a small policy, right? And I would say, let's explore all of these kinds of small policies. And let's stop pretending that the free open market is neutral and doesn't itself create a certain set of outcomes. Of course it does. And in the American context, has created certain outcomes in which we have very few, an increasing, decreasing number of small family-owned businesses and increasing monopolization of our marketplace. That's very interesting. And, and in some ways, it resonates with the work of uh, Nobel Prize winner Eleanor Ostrom yep. and, and the economist Rajan. We were talking about him uh, a few hours ago, uh, where they actually describe the, the negative effects of markets and states uh, when they engage in the piecemeal social engineering of local communities. Um, but 
I think um, we can we can we can think of alternative ways of social life uh, differently if we don't have uh, the pessimistic assumptions that were built into a particular tradition, particularly in economic theory. And, and I think Ostrom's work clearly reflects that. I wanted now to open it for, for, for the Q&A. So given, given the idea of promoting local communities as a way of promoting culture, one first, first question is to what extent these initiatives should be inspired or should draw upon a particular understanding of culture? And to what extent is it possible to think of different ways of developing local communities without necessarily subscribing to a particular culture? Mm -hmm. That's one question. The second one is related to the um, example of uh, Germany, of your father-in-law. Mm -hmm. um, he says that he once met um, a guard who worked during uh, night, during night shifts, mm. and um, he he asked him whether he thought this was a reasonable job, and he said, "Well, yes, because this is the only way I have to both work and see my kids growing mm. up." Uh, so he thinks there might be a trade-off between the opportunities that uninterrupted hours of work might bring to different people on the one hand and on the other the threats and potential negative outcomes of let's say extended job or uh, extended hours or opening hours and so on sure yeah um, I so to the first uh, the first question on, on the question of culture um, I, I actually think uh, the word culture naturally implies diversity. Nat I mean, naturally implies diversity. What is I mean, one of the core qualities of what I just described of the liberal anti-culture is that it's homogenizing. It's standardizing. It makes more and more of the world in every respect identical. It flattens, right, what, what uh, Thomas Friedman called the right the the flat uh, like flat earth uh, theory yeah. yeah and this is this is it seems to me that uh, it's precisely anti culture that renders all of our human exp the experience of human reality more or less homogenous and homogenizing uh, an example of this if in my world is that uh, higher education in the united states was once incredibly culturally diverse a lot of different kinds of institutions that uh, many cases arose from different religious traditions, um, had different ways of understanding what the purpose of education was and how best to achieve that. And in the American context, what we see is an incredible standardization and homogenization of institutions of higher education in which it almost doesn't matter anymore where one teaches or where one goes to do a graduate degree because it's all been rendered exactly the same. And yet notice that these same institutions are constantly talking about diversity. This is their one big word about what they think they're about and how much this project of diversity actually is in the service of this homogenizing project. Right? And this is again one of these sleight of hands, I think, that we see uh, happening in this corner of the world. So I think precisely, uh, and this is, of course, where this is a fraught issue. It's certainly fraught in the United States, and I'm sure is fraught as well here, too, that um, I would like to see a great degree of deference toward the Catholic idea of subsidiarity, toward the idea that there's the idea of local genius, that people will care more for the things that are closer to them. They will be more likely to invest themselves in ways that go well beyond the usual economic calculus, right? what Pope Benedict and Pope Francis have called economy of gift, that out of a, out of a superfluity of our love for our places and our people, our traditions, the idea of posterity, of the future, future generations, 
that people will be more likely to invest of themselves in the things that are close to them. And I would like for liberal societies today, which are otherwise so centralizing, to give a far greater degree of deference to a variety of local forms of life while recognizing, and this is when I, that passage you read, we must recognize the benefits of liberalism while recognizing that, of course, these forms have also been sources of oppression and, and terrible oppression. And here we need to be ju good judges. We need judgment, that classical virtue of phronesis. What is a genuine oppression? What is a genuine oppression? And what is, in some ways, a form of culture that we will have to, you know, in that context, will have to be accepted because there will be deference to that form. And perhaps we must say that, you know, if it gets so bad that someone may want to leave that place, and that's at least an American, that's an American tradition, get out of the place, right? So this is, a, this is a difficult question, of course, context will matter. But I would say that one of the things in a liberal society is that we put aside the question of judgment in favor of simply saying, let's simply eliminate culture and relieve ourselves of the, of the requirement of judgment, because it's too difficult. So in fact, I'm in favor of um, diversity, if I could put it that way. I think one of the great debates uh, of um, the last century was it was often the conservatives who were defenders of diversity in the form of culture. I give you two names, Edmund Burke and G.K. Chesterton, who were often opposing progressive liberals who favored liberal imperialism. Right. Uh, Burke against someone like John, well, is out, of, out of date, but out of, against someone like John Stuart Mill who was himself an imperialist, right, who believed that liberal forms should exist everywhere. In fact, in the first two pages of his book on liberty, John Stuart Mill argues that societies that are not liberal may have to be enslaved for a period of time until they can be made free. Right. The barbarians. Yeah, the barbarians. Yeah. So, uh, so in fact, I think uh, when we speak of this idea of culture, it has to be we have to think about it as diverse and multiple and will, and will arise from the particular circumstances of different places and the experience of those places and those people. I'm sorry, now I forgot the second part of the question. The guard, the night shift. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how that speaks to the example of um, that I gave. Hmm. I. I, I guess I offered that example um, mainly not to not to necessarily say here's the here's the policy we should institute everywhere. I, I, I'm not wed to that, but I am wed to the. And what I the reason I offered that example was to say that in proposing that our that what I think should be our core principle, which is building a world in which, let's, let's begin at the most basic level, the, the human family flourishes. I think yeah, that would be, that, that to me is, look, every, if we want to talk about social science and uh, evidence, every piece of social science, every study, every, every examination argues that your chance of living a good life depend on growing up in a stable family of a mother and a father, everything every study, and we can have debates over whether schooling or whether this, that, or the other. Every study says grow up in a stable household of a mother and a father, and your, your chances of having a flourishing life rise enormously. Therefore, shouldn't every policy of, of government in some form or another of our public lives be oriented to or toward the question Will this policy help or hurt the family? Right. Or even let's push this argument further. What are the policies that will help the family? If we're going to have a free market economy at some level, are there ways in which we can structure the free market economy to help and support families? Right. So 
I, I agree, and I think the work of many free market economists showing the deforming effects of many government policies on the market are valuable. But I would like to see as much attention played, uh, as much attention paid to the question, not only what are the deforming effects on the efficiency of the market, but what are the potential effects on, of any policy upon the family? And with all recognition of the need for humility, of our ability to predict these things, to begin to examine ways that we might develop policies hmm. that will assist um, the flourishing of family life. And that's an inequality issue there as well, right? Absolutely, absolutely. The likelihood of a well-off family of being stable and well-structured are far beyond the likelihood of, uh, uh, let's say, someone in the second decile of the population of having a stable right. family. Yeah. So even on inequality grounds, you could argue that families should I think, take I think, priority. I think, frankly, on equality grounds, that would be a good place to start. Yeah. Um, and again, this is, uh, this is especially striking today in the United States, in which uh, a series of books have come out in recent years uh, with accumulating evidence that a stable, good family life is now a luxury good in the United States. Hmm. That if you're in a certain socioeconomic and educational strata, you have a f just, inf you know, just, just immeasurably higher likelihood of having stable and good family life. And I would say that a good society does not make fam good families a luxury good. And that would widen the inequalities even more, right? Of course. Of course it does. In fact, it makes it deeply and profoundly permanent. Yep. I, uh, your, your, your question uh, is maybe the question, uh, which is, if you live in a liberal age, how is it possible to be a conservative when if you are conserving something, it's liberalism, right? In other words, you're conserving something that can't conserve. So you have to, in some ways, be something else. Uh, you have to propose something else merely than, let's keep things the same. So you said you may not be a radical. And I would say in two ways. I think we have to think radically. And I, ho I hope, I think my book was an effort to try to think radically. And of course, this word radical, radice, we go to the roots. Right. I think we have to think radically. But maybe as conservatives, or myself as a conservative, try to avoid revolution, because we know not good things can happen from revolution. Uh, rather, as, I, as the passage that Matthias read, perhaps we need a vision of where we would like to go and understand that it would be probably a terrible thing to try to go from point A to point Z by next week. That's not going to go well. But if we can go from point A to point C in the next five years, we're already closer. Right. So what would it be? Here maybe we need some thinking about policy, we need some thinking about practical things, about going from point A to point C. You know, that should be, we have in mind Z, we have in mind the goal, but we recognize that politics, to use the phrase from Havel, Vaclav Havel, politics is the art of the possible. Right. And uh, that we need to see that to be, in some ways, a conservative is not only to seek to conserve, but to be cautious about how we proceed. Now, this is to treat politics as a little bit as a, um, uh, as a science experiment, which of course it's not. So we can sit here in this room and you know, lay out a, a map, but you know as soon as you start a journey, like the people going up to Mount Everest recently, <laughs> things can happen. Right. The journey is not going to be as direct as you thought it was. And I just think that politics is simply not a road map. We have to treat it as, in some senses with a sense of vision, but then um, be aware that reality is messy. So I, I think there are two ways of being conservative in this sense. There's conservative as a radical notion, especially in a liberal time. And there's the kind of conservative disposition of how one proceeds in that world. And here, I guess, my, the way that I have in part done this is by trying, you know, at least in my very personal life, to, to try to find ways of living that I hope 
among other things, both for my family and for my students, and even for people who happen, I happen to meet in South Bend, in a way can serve as something of an example, or um, more than that, can help me um, to um, help me to live the theory, if I can put it that way. I, I did something that I think for college professors in the United States is unthinkable, which is to leave Washington, D.C., a tenured job at Georgetown University. I had lifetime employment uh, to leave for a cornfield uh, in, uh, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I don't think I would describe it exactly like that, because uh, it's somewhere. Everywhere is somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, pr but primarily not because it was necessarily a better job, although there are certain aspects that are better. Um, it wasn't because I was going to make more money, although housing is cheaper. Uh, but it was primarily because we wanted to live our lives, my wife, myself, and my family, live our lives as, as members embedded in a community. And to feel like um, our lives weren't um, uh, deeply divided, uh, segmented, fragmented, so that my work and my home were connected which they are, I'm very close to where I work. And my colleagues at work and my neighbors are the same. And my neighbors and my colleagues at work are also the people I worship with on Sunday. And so to live a life of integration. And it seems to me that this is, this is a difficult thing. This may be the most difficult thing in a liberal world is to live a life of integration. So how is it that we lead lives that, right, think of this word integration, I hope it's the same in Spanish. It's related to the word integrity. To live a life of integrity is to lead a life of integration. So I think, I think if we can make it easier in our world to be people of integrity means we have to make it more possible to live lives of integration. And this is difficult to do. And it may take decisions that seem on the surface to be crazy. But in fact, at a deeper level, um, I hope and I aspire to be trying to live with a certain kind of integrity. So I... Um, yeah. Uh, as a result, uh, I, I can say that I'm personally happier, even though the restaurants aren't as good. <laughs> so, well, Patrick, we it's that, been yeah. a real pleasure talking to you again today. And please join me in, well, in thanking Patrick.